Okay, I'm ready. Introduction. introduction. So, uh, yeah, I've been in Boston for uh, many years, and uh, uh, but before that, I was uh, in New York City. That's where I was a graduate student at Columbia, and I learned about braids from John Berman, who was uh, had written this uh, amazing book on braids and things and uh, mapping class groups. And um, but then I, at that time, I didn't think. I thought it was okay. It was fun, but it's kind of it seems a little bit too easy, you know. I mean, just braids. I mean, what's uh, and uh, I got kind of uh, sucked up in a. Uh, we just heard about the smooth Poincare conjecture. I was kind of laughing because I was trying to actually disprove the smooth uh, variant of this uh, Poincare conjecture for uh, RP4 to show is a counterexample, a fake. And I thought I had it for about a year as a graduate student, and then I wasted a year of my graduate's uh, life there, and then it, there was a sign mistake I was making. So in the end, after 30 years, they still work for 30 years. Other people, I kind of gave up, moved to some other stuff. And um, it, actually, it was not a counterexample. So, <laughs> so it just, and you know, at some point, I got back to braids. And um, uh, I realized that uh, actually, there is quite a bit of depth to it, and quite a bit of challenge. And there are so many aspects that. I really enjoyed, so, and I tried to kind of unify what I was doing, you know, with um, things about knots and links and uh, hyperplane arrangements and complex algebraic geometry and group theory and, uh, you know, whatever I'm doing, kind of, so the braids kind of pop up. So let me, I'll show you a few of the things that, uh, where braids come up, and uh, the theme would be braid and configuration spaces, although towards the end, I'm going to also talk about polynomials, you know, polynomial equations and how braids can be used to understand uh, solving polynomial equations and vice versa, okay? But the bridge is done through topology and through configuration spaces. So let's start. Uh, so we start with the topological space. You heard about this, I assume, in yesterday in the lecture about a little bit. Okay, it's a space, okay? Um, with the topology, you have the notion of open sets. So you can do the product of m copies, n copies of m, m to the n, okay? So it's a Cartesian product, so ordered n tuples, and there is a product topology on it. So that's again a space. Think of Rn, for example, r cross r cross rn times, right? And the ordered configuration space of n points in m is this space here, count fam of m. You take all the n tuples of points in m to the n such that all the coordinates are different, or all the points are different. mi is not equal to mj for all i not equal to j, okay? So you take n distinct points and you look at all the, uh, all the such configurations of n distinct points and that's now a new space so if the original space is a manifold, locally it looks like Rn, R to the D, right? So manifold of dimension D, then this configuration space will be again a manifold of dimension D times N, right? You take M to the N, but M has dimension D, mul dimensions multiply, and you get something of dimension D, to D times N. So let's do some easy examples to get started, okay? This is a trivial example. Conf1 is just M. You haven't done anything, there is no condition. Right? There is, uh, there is not enough, there is only a single M and there is no condition on it, so get back M. Okay, conf2, that's the first that has some interest. Two points. So it means you take M cross M minus the diagonal, right? This is where the coordinates are equal along the diagonal. So you take the, think of M here in this picture is just an interval, right? You take the square and you remove the diagonal. And you get two pieces, okay? So, this is not so interesting uh, in the sense that, you know, it's disconnected. It's bro you can break it into pieces. So, suppose M itself, the 
space you start with is connected. It's made of a single piece. You cannot break it into two open disjoint pieces, both of them non-empty. Um, then if the dimension is one, like it's an example, and you have at least two points, like this example, then the configuration space is disconnected, okay? So from the point of view of topology, that's not that interesting. You've seen this kind of phenomenon in the previous talk, is like chopping up a slice of pizza. It becomes more like a combinatorics question, how many slices? So I wanna, you know, stay with topology, get into fundamental groups, so we want the dimension to be at least two. Then the, at least the, the configuration space is connected. Okay, so staying with this, uh, you know, examples, but kind of moving closer, eventually you're gonna, uh, the manifold will be just R, uh, R, R squared. But let's stay now still pretty generally, but specialized to the case where G is not just as, M is not just a space, but it's actually a topological group. It has a dual nature. It's both a group and a topological space and the two structures are compatible. The multiplication map is continuous and the inverse map is continuous. So, for example, Rn or C or, what did I write there, C star equals C minus zero, as the circle S1, matrix groups, and so on. Then the configuration space can be, is homomorphic, it's, it's, you know, can be identified with a product, G times the configuration space with one less particle, think of the points as particles, in G minus the identity, okay? What is the product? You take all the, oh, should I explain again what is the product here? Right, as I said, it's like in Rn, right? And you take with R, you take R squared is pairs, X, Y, right? Rn, you have, you know, x1 dot 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 xn. So you have n tuples, right? So you have n elements from the set, but they are ordered. The order is very important here. It's not a set, it's, it's an order. Um, um, it's like a vector, okay? And here is the same thing. I'm taking n points in G, n elements in G, right? In a given order, G1 dot 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 Gn, and I put G1 here is in G, and here now we have only n minus one of them. And I, using this formula, G1 inverse G2, right? That's, again, an element in G, and so on. And you see these elements now are not equal to the identity. E, E is the identity, is the uh, trivial element. It's the multiplicative, multiplicative element, uh, multiplicative identity of G. So can you tell me why are they in G minus E? You see that? Well, because, you see, this is in the configuration space, so all the elements are distinct, right? That's what it means to be in the configuration space. One more time. We have to digest this definition. All the points are distinct, right? All the elements are distinct. So GI is not equal to GJ, so G2 is not equal to G1. So when you multiply, you don't get identity, you get something else, okay? So now you have N minus some points in G minus C. Okay, so, why do I make a big deal? We'll see here, because you're gonna apply this to configuration space of points in R squared, which is the same thing as, the real plane is the same thing as the complex line. You can identify x, y with x plus i, y, right? Are you familiar with complex numbers? I hope you're familiar, right? Because you're gonna use them all the time. So, now, where was I? So what's the point in the configuration space of N, uh, uh, conf N C? It's an N tuple of distinct points in C, right? So take, think of them Z1, Z2, Z3, and so on, Zn, right? So N points, you've seen this also in the first lecture, right? Think of these N points moving around the circle, right? They're kind of these the kind of dynamics and they, or you had, what do you have? You have robots or little cars moving around. So you can think of them in various ways as points moving in C. In general, they move in, in this manifold M. Okay, so look at configuration spaces in, uh, on a torus or on a, uh, don't, you know, or a Riemann surface of genus G or kind of other kind of spaces, but we'll mainly focus today on just endpoints in the plane. Okay, so 
Let's, now that we have a little bit of theory here, let's see if you can understand a little bit how to decompose these uh, configuration spaces when the number of points is low. So conf1, as I said before, this is just C. Okay? This was the general formula. Conf1 of M is just M, right? No condition. Now, up to homotopy, you learned yesterday about homotopy, right? Spaces can be deformed continuously, in one into the other, so the plane can be contracted to a single point. It's contractible, you can just, everything can be, you know, easiest. Can you see how to contract R squared to zero? Can you kind of describe this contraction? Or this? Um, so it basically you just move along the ray, right? A point, you, you know, if it's a zero, you keep it fixed, you, you think of, polar coordinates. If it's R theta, you know, you just move along uh, the ray with constant angle theta. So you start from here and then you move all the way to the origin. So it's just like an implosion, okay? All right, so that's, up from, from homotopy point of view, this is trivial, right? It's just a point. Now, how about configuration of two points, right? It splits as a C, right? times C minus the, this is a group, right? But what is the group structure on C? Is it addition or multiplication? It's addition, right? Mal um, because, you know, you also have a multiplication. C is also a ring, it's a field, but uh, what is the inverse of zero? Multiplicative is, uh, so, how do you invert zero? Zero is not invertible, right? You cannot do one over zero. So the, the group structure is addition, right? X plus Y. So, <coughs> so it's C cross C minus zero, but now C minus zero, again, I'm having trouble with this pointer. Okay, a little bit, I'm gonna learn it. So what is C minus zero? That's all the points in the plane minus the origin. So what does this now, again, in polar coordinates, R theta just goes to theta, right? You just, again, implode, but not all the way to zero. You take, you divide by the norm. You take a point, which is not the origin, right? So it's up out there, you divide by the norm, you bring it to the unit circle, right? So that's, uh, that's the homotopy that brings C minus zero to S1, and now zero times S1 is just S1. So, Configuration of two points in C is basically, as up to homotopy, it's a circle. So already you start seeing some interesting topology here. Now, this method that I just allowed, very kind of, you know, in a sense elementary, it just uses this single trick that I des uh, described to you. We can go one more step, three points in C. So this is now, Okay, by this formula, it's sig times configuration of two points in C minus zero, right? But now C minus zero, can you tell me what, is, what property does it have? Is the group? It's again a group. With what operation? Multiplication, right? Because the problem, remember, C is not a group with multiplication because of zero. Zero, you know, you cannot invert zero. But once you throw away zero, C minus zero becomes a group with operation, you know, X times Y. Z, time, Z1 times Z2 is Z1, Z2, right? Um, we're using, in fact, that we're using here the, in a strong fashion that C is actually a field, right? It has two operation additional multiplication. In a field, everything is invertible except zero, so, and so on. Okay, so now we can apply again that formula. So we leave the C alone, but now conf2 is you split off C minus zero, right? And now cross C minus zero minus now the unit, the multiplicative unit, which is one, okay? So that's C minus two points. So conf3, so what, what, is, what is it, I mean, how can you identify the configuration space of three points in C. One point can do whatever, it can be anywhere it wants. That's how you get the, C fa the first factor, right? The second factor can be anywhere it wants except zero because you know, they're not supposed to collide. 
And the third factor can be anywhere it wants except the first two, right? So up to homotopy, this guy goes away, it's contractible, this becomes a circle, and C minus two points, that's, again, I think you did that, right? If you take out two points in the plane, everything um, collapses into a wedge of two circles now that I denoted by this, this notation. So the green stuff, this is, these are the two circles, and uh, I didn't put the points here. Zero is right there in the middle, and one is right here. So when you remove them, everything contracts on those uh, rows with two petals, right? or a wedge of two circles, we call it. And then you have the S1 factor, so the whole thing is like two tori, uh, you know, you take this picture with the two green circles joined together, and you rotate it, okay? So what do you get as an object? S1 cross S1 is a torus, right, like a donut. So you get like two donuts, but they're kind of which touch along a circle. Okay, so that's a kind of a description. All right, that's how far you can go with this method. After that, it becomes more complicated. It's still, you still get some kind of decomposition of this sort, you know, C minus three points and so on, uh, but they're no longer just direct products. They become, there is some twisting. There some bundles here, which are non-trivial, okay? So I will not get into that, although that's a very important feature and very in applications. Okay, so that was order configurations. Now let's move on to unordered configurations. Sometimes you don't care about the order, right? You just care, you know, there are these cars moving. Let's see, maybe that's not a good analogy. Well, when would you care about the labels on the points, car one, car two, car three, and so on, and when would you not care about them, the labels? Well, maybe somebody can help me, you know? What would be a good example of an unordered configuration space? You just want to know that there are these particles you move, but you don't really want to label them, okay? So um, let's just accept that as a problem. And in order to describe it, let's back off and kind of say something that you know from other contexts, I hope, is the notion of a permutation on a set. It's just a bijection from the set to itself, right? You just take a, a permutation, you just take a, like a cards and you mix them and you get another, you know, another deck of cards, okay? Well, it's a permutation. I'll take a bunch of number, one, two, three, four, five, and then, you know, you rewrite it as three. 3, 1, 4, 2, 5, right? That's a permutation. It's a bijection, you 1 to 1 and on to. So for example, the set 1, 2 has two permutations. The trivial permutation, 1 goes to 1, 2 goes to 2, and the non-trivial one, okay? 1 goes to 2 and 2 goes to 1. You see, we kind of schematically draw like that. The arrows are allowed to cross here because, again, unlike with braids, you don't care. There is no going over and under here, right, in a permutation. And permutation, again, can be composed, um, like pretty much like in braids, right? This permutation times this permutation, another permutation, you just follow. One goes to two, two goes to two, so one goes to two, and so on, right? So you can compose them, and you get a new permutation. So um, for some reason, okay. So the, the set of all permutations, they are n factorial of those, right, as you know. And um, the set of all permutations acquires the structure of a group called a symmetric group, um, which is a, perhaps arguably the most important finite group creation, right? Every finite group sits inside in a symmetric group, so it, 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 it's been recognized of tremendous importance going back to Galois and, in, you know, but maybe even before, uh, 200 years ago. Um, Okay, so that's the symmetric group. So it's a group of all permutations on the set one to n. Okay, so that's a little bit of a recap of the symmetric group. So far, so good. You've seen the symmetric group in group theory or other places, right? Now, now let's go back to the you know, Cartesian product, right? n to the n. Well, remember, we keep track of the order of the coordinates, right? 
So now the symmetric group acts on this product by sending, how does it act? It takes, it takes a tuple, M1, Mn, and then you know, a permutation sigma in Sn, how does it act on a vector? Let's call it a vector, a tuple, right, or n tuple. It just permutes the indices, right? It sends it to M sigma 1 dot 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 M sigma n, okay? So that way you have in a natural way the symmetric group acting on the Cartesian and fold Cartesian product, okay? Of any space or any set. Okay, so that's a group action. And, but in general, this action will have fixed points, right? I mean, for example, if M1 equal M2 and you do, you know, if you take the permutation one, two, and you act it on, you know, Five, five, right? So let's say that you have this element, right? So it doesn't care, right? Because five equal to five, so you you still get five, five. So it doesn't do anything if there are repetitions. But if you read, if you look now at the action on the subset, which is the configuration space of distinct points, then once you permute, you get something totally different. There is no fixed point. The action that we call this action free. It doesn't have any. It, li it doesn't leave any point invariant because none of the coordinates are equal to each other. So when you do any kind of permutation, you get something totally different, okay? So we call that a free action. So now, this is the next major definition in this talk, is the unordered configuration space of n points is the quotient, right? You take you, you take this configuration space of n distinct points, like we discussed before, and you identify, right, this, 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 I'm not sure if you've seen this, you know, backslash symbol. It means you take the quotient. It's like, you've seen six divided by two is three, right? <laughs> it's, it's kind of an abstraction of the notion of dividing numbers, uh, much higher generality. You take, you take a set on which, you, you have certain identification, you say this is equal to that, and you say, okay, because I have this identification, I'm going to take the equivalence classes under this identification. I'm gonna identify uh, points in the configuration space if they differ by this permutation. I'm gonna consider them as being equal in the quotient. It's like six divided by two, so if you take a set of size six, like one, two, three, four, five, six, and you say two numbers are equivalent if they, you can get from one to the other if you multiply by two or you, and you reduce mod six, you get something of size three. It's the same kind of method. Okay, so then it acquires also, uh, it, it inherits a uh, natural topology now from the configuration space so-called quotient topology. I cannot you know, define all the terms I'm using. I'm you know, slouching over many details that have to be checked and understood here along the way. But um, this can be the, now if you think about this UConf, right? You know, this is not a very satisfactory definition because it's this quotient space. What exactly is it? We, so I'll try to explain in more detail and. As, you, as we shall see, this is very, very intimately related to braids, okay? In case I lost you and think, what does this have to do with braids? Believe me, we're gonna see it very soon. This is what braids are about. They're about, about this UConf, okay? Um, in, you know, in big way. So, where was I? So you can view, if you want a kind of a quick interpretation of this space, Instead of looking at tuples, right, which are called n tuples or vectors, where you keep track of the orders, now you're just taking subsets. See, in a, in a subset, when you put curly bracket instead of parent, open and close parentheses, what's the difference between a vector and a set, right? Say, say n vector and a set of size n. The order doesn't matter. Right. In a, in the order doesn't matter in a set, right? But still, you know, the, the elements are different, so the set has actually size n here, okay? Because you see, if there were repetitions, the set would have smaller size. You, in a set, you throw away the repetitions. But because you don't have a repetitions, this is actually a set of size n. 
So this unordered configuration space is a set of all subsets of fixed size n. Okay? So in down to our stem, you look at now n tuples, you know, again, like n robots or n zombies or cars or whatever you want to think moving around in the plane. But you don't keep track, you don't know which one is what, you know, what, what color they have or what shape or anything. You just know there are n guys kind of moving around, okay? All right, so let's look a little bit in for n equal two. So, and then, oh, no, I skipped a line here. So the quotient map I talked about that defines this u conf is actually, now I have to rely on the previous lecture. Maybe Rick is going to tell me, you cover, covers? You drew this picture? Oh, okay. All right, well, that's. <laughs> I, yeah, I always, yeah, I always draw yeah, I always draw them vertically, but I was running out of space there, so I drew it horizontally. Um, so it's the map, you know, s1 to s1, z goes to z squared, and you take a, uh, this. This is the this is the, the if you want the quotient map, or the picture is more, you know, you identify, you take the circle and you wrap it up twice, and then you project with the circle. So that's a twofold cover. You see here on the top, this is the boundary of the Möbius band. You can think of the boundary of the Möbius band double covering the core of the Möbius band. You see the Möbius band somewhere here? Right there. That's a Möbius band. OK. So that's uh, up to homotopy, the, this, uh, this map from the ordered configuration space to the unordered configuration space. You lose information, so you cut down the side you know, in two. In, in a sense, right? You, you forget the label. So, for example, here you have these two points. One is, you know, think of one is red and one is blue. So you go to something which has lost its color, right? It just remembers the position, but it forgets the color in, a way, in some sense. Okay. All right. So that's that's this covering space. It's in general uh, the, the fiber of this cover, right? The preimage of a point will not be n points. How many points will be in the pre-image? That's a guess, it, but more than that. Anybody cares to make another guess? Remember, we're mudding out by what? By Sn, right? So the number of points we identify together is the size of Sn which is? Well, I asked here, yeah, but I remind you that we, uh, we talked about the size of Sn is n factorial, right? We said, right, there are n factorial permutations. Well, okay, maybe when you see permutations and you see that. They are good, but they the first time. Oh, yeah? OK, all right. Did you see before? No? OK. <laughs> um, all right. So anyhow, that's a fun. If you forget about everything I said today, remember the, size, the number of permutations, the way you can rearrange, right? How many kind of you think of, if you have a deck of 52 cards, right? You know, how many ways can you kind of, you know, uh, how do you say, mix this, the, the deck, how do you call that? You shuffle the deck, it's 52 factorial. What is that? That's a big number, right? One times two times three times four up to times 52. Maybe it's bigger than the number of atoms in the universe. Maybe it's three numbers, three numbers it's easier to see. Because you have one, two, three. And you want to see what is the number of orders. You can put one, two, three. So if you put one in the beginning, you have two and three. And you have three and two. So one in the beginning, there are two options. Number you start with, you have two, so it's two times three. Now, if it's four, you fix one in the beginning, and then you have two, three, four. So we know already that three number is six. Beginning 
one sweep, four is six, so it's four times six. So it comes 24, and then so forth, it comes to n factorial. Okay. Very good. <laughs> right. So, okay, so we got through this covering space. Um, okay, so now let's try to now, okay, so this was configuration space, which is kind of half my title. But I'm trying now to connect it back to braid groups, right? Otherwise, why am I talking about this, right? We haven't seen any braids yet, right? Although, you know, when you see these particles moving around, it should kind of remind you of braids, right? A little bit. You should see them coming. But how exactly? Okay, so now let's also do, do a very brief review of fundamental group, which, again, let me kind of appeal to Rick. You, co you cover fundamental groups, right? Right, well, that's why I'm a brief review, but you covered up to homotopy, right? Okay, so here is a brief review of what you heard yesterday, right? Huh? <laughs> but it doesn't hurt to review, right? <laughs> that's so, okay, so to a space, you want to associate a group, right, in a nice way, kind of. Um, but in order to do that, um, with this fundamental group, one of the kind of the technical points that sounds kind of silly in the beginning, but you realize this is actually a hugely important point, you, you have to fix a base point, okay? So once you have a, a space and a base point, then you can look at the loops at that base point, right? All the um, um, maps from uh, 0, 1 to M, such uh, maps gamma that goes from 0, 1 to M, such that gamma of 0 equal gamma 1 equal x0, this fixed base point, okay? So you, for example, if this is your space, you kind of travel along this loop, uh, <coughs> this would be a, a loop here, right? You start, this is x0 here, so you travel this way. You could travel this way, or you could travel, you know, 100 times here and then come back, okay? So these are the very, you sample your space by looking, traveling on all the possible loops, right? Now, that's, a, that's called a loop space. It has a, uh, its own topologies, but it's a huge space if you just look at all the loops, okay? So to make it more tractable, you, again, take a quotient by an equivalence relation. Say two loops are equivalent. If one can be continuously deformed into the other, while preserving the, you know, the endpoints st still should always go to the base point. The base point is sacrosanct, right? You cannot touch it. It has to be kept fixed, okay? For the purpose of this notion. So, and that becomes now a um, group with multiplication given by concatenation of, of the two loops, okay? You just travel first gamma one and then gamma two, right? In half the time, you go twice as fast on the, sec on the first loop and then back and go twice as fast on the second loop, right? So that's how you multiply loops by, you know, one after the other. In a manner kind of reminiscent how you multiply braids. There you concatenate, also you put one on top of the other, now you follow the two loops. And the inverse loop, you just travel, you know, on the opposite direction and the identity is just the constant loop at x0, okay? So this, do you know who made this definition for the first time? This is, you know, many people put the beginning of modern topology in 1895. It was a paper which, when this definition was, you know, promulgated by Poincaré. You heard his name? Uh, Henri Poincaré, right, also the Poincaré conjecture. It was around the same time. It was, a, it was an amazing sequence of papers that got published in an obscure journal, in the Journal of Mathematical Society of Palermo, <laughs> Sicily. <laughs> in, yeah. And, and also some other paper in France, but it, it wasn't, yeah. And this. You know, Well, he was in Paris, but I don't know why he's published in Palermo. I don't know. Uh, so, 
Okay, so that's, that's some, uh, the, the letter pi, I think, is in honor of Poincaré. This is the Greek letter pi for P, which is from Poincaré, okay? So it was also called the, you know, he could have called it the Poincaré group. Some people wanted to call it the Poincaré group, but he was modest and it's called the fundamental group, okay? Um, oh, anyhow, so that's the fundamental group, which is, as the name indicates, of fundamental importance in topology. Uh, it marks the start of modern topology. Uh, Okay, if the space is path connected, any two points can be connected by uh, a path, right? A continuous path from one to the other, that's what means path connected. Then, in a sense, it doesn't matter where you put the base point. If you take two different base points, the two resulting groups are isomorphic, okay? So you can drop the, uh, uh, the base point from the notation and just write it pi on fm. Although that's kind of dangerous, because this is one of the big traps in topology, is the base point problem. Probably also in algebraic geometry, right? I mean, there's so many, it's one of the canonical mistakes in mathematics you can make is by ignoring the base point, and there are all sorts of kind of subtleties that you have to keep track of this base point, okay? Even if you suppress it, it doesn't mean that it cannot, you know, come back to haunt you, like the Cheshire's cat. Am I mixing metaphors? The oh, Cheshire's cat that. green, you know, right. It's there. Be the Cheshire cat, it's one of those stories. I don't know if it's in literature, right? Where does it appear? In, uh, uh, Alice in Wonderland? Right. <laughs> right. So the base point, keep it track. There is a base point always, even if I don't put it there, that you should keep track, especially when you can talk about maps and, you know, that don't have to preserve the base point. Okay, anyhow, let's move on. So, to finish this review, let's do some examples which are relevant to this lecture. So, if the space is contractible, if it can be deformed to a point, then pi on of a point is just trivial, right? There is only a single loop, namely the trivial loop, the constant loop, so pi on is E. So, for example, if the space is Rn that we decide it can be contracted to zero, then pi one is trivial, right? So, pi one sort of sends trivial spaces up to homotopy, contractible spaces to the trivial group. So it has this nice feature. More generally, if two spaces are homotopy equivalent, then the, the resulting fundamental groups are isomorphic. So C minus zero, we decided that's homotopy equivalent to S1. And now, that's a non-trivial fact. It's actually kind of, you know, if you want to do all the details, do this in uh, graduate topology courses, pi one of the circle is z. That actually involves hovering space theory. And it's kind of related to the fundamental theorem of algebra and many other things. So, so did you prove pi one equal s1 equal z, Rick? Or tell? Okay. You discuss it, okay. So you've seen that before, right? Okay. Uh, and more generally, if we take n points out of uh, the plane here, c minus n points, that deforms to uh, this uh, rows with n petals, or the wedge of n circles, and then pi one is now fn. What is fn? It's a huge group. Is the free group on n letters. You can write all the possible words in an alphabet involving n letters. Okay. So F2, you have only two letters, A, B. So you can write all the possible words. A, B, A inverse, B inverse, A squared. You know, you just write strings uh, where your alphabet, well, is A, B together with A inverse and B inverse. Okay. And if like A follows A, prime, A inverse, you can cancel and so on, you can shorter. So there are, again, some rules, but except for obvious cancellations, there is no cancellation. It's a non-commutative group, okay? So pi one, this is a, a billion, this is commutative, right? E plus B equal B plus, you know, five plus seven is seven plus five, but if you do A, B, A inverse, B inverse, that's not equal to one, because there is no cancellation. Okay. Theorem, I won't put, uh, uh, okay, so this is where, here we have a precise date, 60 years ago, 
when the connection between configuration spaces and Bray groups was made. This is my title of my talk, so I better kind of tell you when this happened. So it, uh, it was in a paper published, I think it was Mathematica Scandinavica, which is, again, okay, you know, it's not maybe the, it's, it's a good journal, but it's not maybe the most famous journal. So, but it was an extremely influential and important paper in the development of all this theory by Ralph Fox from Princeton and uh, Fadel, do you know his first name? I forgot now his first name, okay. I think from Wisconsin. So uh, Fox and Fadel prove, um, uh, established the following isomorphism. The fundamental group of the configura ordered configuration space is the pure braid group, PN. And the unordered is the full braid group, BN. Okay, so let's pause here. Have you seen this notation PN before? Pure braids, you didn't? Yes? Okay, so what's a pure braid? Anybody can guess what's a pure braid? So braid, you just start here and start kind of twisting and twisting and then you come back down, right? By, so pure braid, it means that once you come back down, uh, the points are back in the, exactly the same order. So if the order one, two, three, four, five, you do whatever twisting you want, but you have to come back to one, two, three, five. So it's called pure braid, okay? So the corresponding permutation, you see a braid induces a permutation of the strings, right? So one kind of does its merry way, it's come back to one, right? Two does whatever it wants, it comes back to two and so on. That's a pure braid right there, okay? In general, the braids will induce a permutation of one to n, okay? So th those are not pure or not colored. Some people like the Russian school call them colored braids, I think. That's how Arnold called them, right? Or dyed braids. They think of one is red, one is blue, one is yellow, so, uh, and then they have to come back to the same color. Okay. And what's the proof of the theorem? Well, it's proved by picture, okay? For the, for the first one, I mean. Um, so this is a braid, right? Thought, I think that's how Nancy said, right? Kind of dynamics, right? At time zero, and then you have a slice, and you go from one half and one. So you think of the braid, and also you do the same kind of direction, I remember, from top to bottom. Oh, <laughs> okay. Like, I think that two conventions, one is called the East Coast Convention, one is the West Coast Convention. So. I see. <laughs> Okay, then what is sigma one? Do you go, which one, which strand goes over, over? <laughs> right, as you can see there, so basically there are four conventions. Yeah, and I think even the United States, I mean, that's why I remember what I, I, hearing from John Berman, there is a West Coast Convention, East Coast Convention. It comes from Russia, Do you know? Well, there, there is an issue. I mean, you have to be, uh, yeah, I confronted these issues also. Uh, yeah, it, it's, it's not just kind of matter of, at some point you have to make sure that conventions agree and you don't get a contradiction. And it's uh, whether uh, you think. Sometimes people make mistakes because even if they know intuitively when they multiply well. bread, But the real mathematical issue is that when you think of the braids as being automorphism of the free group via this Artin representation, whether it's right automorphism or left automorphism. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. And then uh, you write it on the right if it's a right automorphism, left it's a left automorphism. And it's, it's a mess. I mean, that's part of the difficulty in the subject, I, you know. And also. Yeah, mathematics is difficult enough, but my mathematician, but having contradicting notation makes it more difficult. Every time I write, I, I have to kind of remember what are the conventions, and I try to explain them just so everybody understands what so I'm talking this, about. Uh, 
Okay, anyhow, so to finish the proof, quote on proof, right? This is the base point, think of C, right? Uh, this is the base point, one to N, right? And then look at the pure braid that I just drew. And if you think about it, right? It, it's a loop in the ordered configuration space, right? At each point you see as you traverse the braid, you get N distinct points. Why is that? That's very, that's crucial, right? It's because the braid, you don't allow braids to come back or cross or do anything kind of crazy, right? They, they have to kind of flow very nicely. They can go around, but they never cross or never back up, right? So because of that, this is actually a path in this configuration space, which is actually a, a loop, a closed loop, because when you get to the bottom, uh, you get back to the same base point, okay? But you see, so that's essentially the proof. That's kind of the dictionary, and then, you know, you see here there are some, I, I, uh, you know, you do, remember in the configuration space, you do some homotopy, you identify loops if they differ by homotopy. Here, in the, on the other side, you also do an identification, right? Maybe, Na who talked about it? Maybe Nancy, you talked about isotopy of braids and how you can deform one to the other, so braids are actually equipped. Or whatever. Okay, so so there is a kind of an analogous notion, and you have to kind of check, and it's not difficult that homotopy of path corresponds to this wiggling of braids or homotopy or isotopy. Anyhow, so that's the proof, right? And then you do the same thing. You do kind of a similar reasoning for the full braid group by remembering that here you don't keep track of the order. So even if we come back, but not in the same order, you are the same base point in the unordered configuration space. Because they will be at the same position, nevertheless. Even if they're, you don't mark them, but you know, this point one is really the one on the real line, the point one there, okay? You see, in the course of the braid, you see this one is no longer, the, the braids at each slice, the, the points can kind of wander around. They're no longer exactly in the same position. Okay, so that's the proof. Um, now, what does this buy you? I mean, it goes back and forth. I mean, it goes from topology to group theory and back and forth. Uh, one thing is that, remember, you have this covering space. And now, for covers, we, we have, you know, a relationship between the fundamental groups of... Uh, the covering space and the, the, the base of the cover and the group of covering transformations. So this non-relationship gives an, a short exact sequence, uh, Pn, Bn, Sn. Have you seen this before? This relation? Hmm? Okay, well, maybe one of the lectures. I, I'm, not, I'm not sure if anybody mentioned this. So if not, okay, let me explain then. So first of all, what's an exact sequence? So there, there is a map here from Bn to Sn that, uh, that sends a braid to the induced permutation, right? One, two, three. For example, this one, this braid, sigma one here, goes to this permutation. One goes to two, two goes to one. So you, you ignore the actual crossings. You just retain the information, you know, which, what point goes to what point, okay? So, and this map is not just a map, it's a homomorphism, it preserves uh, the, multi the concatenation of braids goes to concatenation of uh, permutations. You do exactly the same kind of thing. If you are careful with right versus left, here you have to be careful so you don't use opposite conventions in the symmetric group and the braid group. Then you get into trouble. As long as you use the same conventions, this is a homomorphism, okay? All right, so that's half of the sequence, but then the pure braid group here, um, I guess you have to, yeah, uh, you, you realize that that's, that's actually the kernel of this map. You heard the word the kernel, I think, in, there was that wonderful video, right? What was the kernel? <laughs> it was defined for you because somebody was wearing the word kernel on a, on a costume. But did you say what the kernel was? It's the thing that kind of dies under this uh, homomorphism. You know, 
uh, you are talking about representations, but representations is just another word for homomorphism. Um, so this is the kernel. These are the, the braids that go to the trivial uh, permutation. So the pure braids from the kernel of that um, uh, homomorphism, those are, they are not detected. You see, this, this is what really makes the break group interesting, is the difference between it and the symmetric group, right? Otherwise, if there was no kernel, then Bn is just a sense. So there is nothing new here, right? But the, the, the kind of the heart of the matter uh, lies in this kernel, which is the pure break group. So, and you kind of encode this in a shorthand with, with this is called an exact sequence. It means that this, this map is subjective, this map is injective, and this is exactly the kernel, okay? So that's the jargon is that this is a short exact sequence. Okay, so examples, n equal one, you have b1 is z, p1 is z, so the, 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 and s1 is one. So there is nothing interesting here. Uh, the break group is z generated by sigma one, okay? Um, no, I'm sorry. No, there is a single break, actually, no, 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 no sigma one. It's just, it's the three, what, what did I say? Did I say it correctly here? B1, no, I made a mistake here, right? B1 is just, um, isn't a trivial group, right? There, 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 is, there is a single strand, right? So there, there is no way to, yeah, no, so, sorry, I made a mistake there. Um, That's the joke that you made about the <laughs> Someone asks a question and then he doesn't know the answer, so it goes from one side of the room to the other, thinking, thinking, and then goes again, and again. <laughs> no, they go again and again, and then they said, ah, oh, it's trivial, <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so now that was, uh, this... Don't have much yeah. yeah, okay, so let me, so n equal two, and that's what I meant, p2 is z and b2 is z, and this is multiplication by two, and the, uh, the image then s2 is just z2. We went through that argument in this picture. This corresponds to this picture here, right? And... Um, for n equal three, we identify a P3, Z3 cross F2, but B3 then fits into this exact sequence, and S3 is this group of order six. Okay, so that's how much you can say. But let me just uh, end this uh, section, um, and getting close also to the end of my talk, is that once you have this, inter topo this is a topological interpretation of braids, in terms of fundamental groups of these spaces, it, you know, there is now back and forth between the two notions, and you can get a lot of insights about the break groups by understanding the topology of the configuration spaces. In particular, because they have this kind of structure that I alluded to, um, iterated bundles with uh, fiber uh, punctured plane um, and punctures, uh, these are so-called KPI ones or eilenberg mclean spaces. And so all the topology of this configuration space is in essentially concentrated in the braid groups. Once you understand the braid group, it understands computer space and vice versa, okay? But I cannot explain that, so I'll skip, yeah. All right, so in <laughs> my time is... This is a good time to stop, it could be a good time to stop. Okay. Don't stop and you're talking. This is, okay, I mean, I spent actually most of my time preparing this one, which is kind of new. Um, yeah, okay, let's stop, but just to say that in words, um, maybe I'll, I'll, okay, to say, I mean, what was the plan? This will be like a second lecture. Well, tomorrow I have a different talk, but maybe I'll, I, I'll, I'll just flip the slides, okay, and then I stop, okay? So you can interpret this configuration space in terms of polynomials and roots of polynomials and coefficients, then there is this Vieta map and so on, discriminant. So, you know, I'm getting to the quadratic formula that was known back to the Babylonians. And here is a picture. You can also, you start seeing for the cubic, you start seeing singularities, you start seeing the trefoil knot here, and then for n equal four. So you can understand B2 as the fundamental group as the complement of this parabola in the plane. So it's just Z, which is generated by this single braid. But once you get to the cubic polynomials, which explain what B3 is, you get 
the complement of this uh, of this cusp, which has a singularity at zero. We heard about singularities. If people ask, what is a singularity? That's a singularity right there. And uh, that's pi one of the unisphere in C squared, which is S3 minus a trefoil. So you can interpret B3 as the fundamental group of the complement of a knot. In fact, the, the trefoil knot, which is the closure um, of, of this braid, sigma one cubed. Anyhow, and then, you know, and I'll end with n equal four. I was actually doing these computations last night, you know, try to figure this out. What is the discriminant? And you get something called the swallow tail singularity, and this is my last slide. So in order to understand B4, you have to understand this picture here, which is called the swallowtail singularity. And the reason is that it looks like the tail of this bird, the swallow. And actually, this picture I took from Wikipedia is uh, from Marcos Island, which is, I understand, right here in Florida. So that's a, you see how this looks like, uh, this kind of. And uh, this, pic, uh, this painter, Salvador Dali, right, was, we talked about art, and the mean I was talking about, he was fascinated by this story, and he, uh, uh, he painted. This is a painting by Salvador Dali, which is in the museum, and he called it the swallow's tail. And you can see the singularity. And I'm not sure exactly what are these markings. Yeah, well, that's why I kind of I prepared all this, but it, it takes too long to explain all this. So I'll stop. Okay. <laughs>